Welcome back. I'm Barry Craig. Fifty years ago, the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union threatened to turn hot in a big way, a nuclear way. The Soviets decided to wall off West Berlin, the American, the British, and the French sectors. This caused quite a crisis. I'm 61. I can still remember seeing graphic photographs of American tanks pulled up at Checkpoint Charlie and Soviet tanks on the other side. And, and I think the whole world prayed and hoped that some hothead wouldn't decide to pull a trigger, push a button, and start World War III. A number of Kentuckians were called up in the Berlin crisis. And my guest today is doing some research into them to get to get interviewed with them and get this on record. He is John Trowbridge. He is the command historian of the Kentucky National Guard based in Frankfurt. Thank you for coming down to see us today. Sure, thank you. I appreciate you uh, having me down to uh, to talk about this topic. So how did you get interested in this topic and, uh, and tell us exactly what you're going to do? Okay. Uh, well, basically how I got involved in this was a couple of years ago, uh, I was approached by our director of facilities there at Boone National Guard Center, uh, retired uh, Chief Warrant Officer 4, Joe Wilkins. Joe, when uh, he started his career with the Kentucky National Guard as an enlisted man, was a young uh, private uh, that served in the 2nd Tank. He was a supply sergeant. Well, while they were stationed at Fort Knox, uh, the post chaplain at Knox had come up with this brilliant idea of having new or putting stained glass windows into the post chapel. And so what they ended up doing was trying to figure out how they were going to fund this. And they got looking around and you know not only our Kentucky guys were activated, you also had reserve component units. So Knox had a bunch of not only home station units or, or Knox active component units there, but reserve and then National Guard that were stationed there during uh, this activation. And what they came up with, uh, he had gotten all the chaplains from the various units together and presented his idea and said if your battalion would pay uh, to have one of these stained glass windows, then we'd put the stained glass window in the post chapel in honor of the, your, your organization. And Joe said, I remember we had a formation and our battalion chaplain explained that to us and they passed the hat. He said, I think I pitched a quarter into that hat. And uh, they made those windows. And then in the late 1990s uh, with BRAC and everything that was going on uh, as far as all of our installations, uh, it looked like Knox was going to be gone and then it back on again. But basically the old chapel was torn down. And uh, Joe... Uh, said somebody had mentioned to him that the old stained glass windows that had been in that chapel somebody had saved but he, they didn't know who. So Joe had contacted me and I got hold of some of my <coughs> buddies there at the uh, Patton Museum and said hey you know anything about these stained glass windows? And believe it or not we went out to Richardson Motor Park which is one of their storage facilities mm -hmm. and dug around and found those windows. And we were able to find the one that, that the uh, tank battalion had paid for because the distinctive unit insignia was incorporated into that stained glass. So, and then also had a uh, black and white photograph when they dedicated this thing. So we were able to go back in and verify that this was actually that stained glass mm -hmm. window. And uh, <coughs> come to find out this thing was not on anybody's property book. They just, when they, were tearing that structure down. They just pulled them out, crated them up, and set them in, in uh, Richardson Motor Pool with no plans of what they were going to do with it. So we ended up, I, I talked with the, the guys at Patton Museum. I said, can you put this on your property book? Once you do that, then you can transfer it to our National Guard pro historic property book, which is what we did. It took about mm -hmm. a year, uh, and then we got the phone call and said, come and get this. So. Uh, Basically, we went down and, and picked the things up. We've refurbished, and I mean, they are in fabulous shape. And uh, we've refurbished it. In fact, next year, which will mark the 50th anniversary of the return of the Tank Battalion, uh, we're looking at placing <coughs> it down at Wendell Ford Regional Training Center mm -hmm. uh, and having a big reunion of the, the two Tank Battalions that were activated in the Ordnance Company. Yeah. But that, in, in essence, is how I got started on so this. So you'll thing. be interviewing as many people as you possibly can? Yes, sir. Can. Uh, we're trying to interview as, as many as we possibly can. You know, we, the Kentucky Guard, 
you know, I came on board in 2006 as a command historian. I'm really the first historian, full-time historian mm -hmm. the Guard has had. And sadly, we've got such a fabulous, fabulous uh, history and lineage of our Kentucky National Guard, but nobody had ever taken the time to compile this data and this information. Uh, we were kind of our own worst enemies, doing all these great and grand things, mm -hmm. but nobody there collecting this data and this information up uh, you know, to tell our story. And so it, it's kind of fallen on my back to, to do that. Mm -hmm. and, and not only to, to recognize these milestone anniversaries, but then also to capture our current operations and, and you know, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I tell them every day, I said, you guys are making too much history for me to keep up with, <laughs> you, you know. So it, uh, it's, it's been a real labor of love. I, I really enjoy it. Uh, you know, so, you know, not only doing the oral history interviews, but also to capture those photographs. Believe it or not, we've got video that some of the guys shot in color uh, for that time frame and, uh, you know, that has survived. We've, we've got all that stuff. We're trying to digitize all of it. I've got this publication that we're putting mm -hmm. together on the, uh, the history of the call-up uh, for the Kentucky Guard. So uh, a lot of moving parts to, to make this uh, 50th mm -hmm. anniversary happen. Well, to put this in historical context, um, this, this, this happens. We, we all sit on television. Well, some of us did. Right. All to remember. Oh yeah, absolutely. So these, what happens next? They're, they're, the call up comes from the president? Right. Basically what ends up happening, and, and as you uh, preface this, you talked about the, the construction of the Berlin Wall. I have so many people, you know, talk about the Bay of Pigs and the Francis Gary Power incident, or Powers incident. This was not part of that whatsoever. Mm -mm. Bay of Pigs was later on. Mm -hmm. Francis Gary was prior to this event. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the last major uh, Cold War event that happened in Europe was the, the construction of the Berlin Wall. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right. I mean, if somebody had pulled a trigger, pushed a button, we would have been involved in, in World War III. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had a, num a couple of these uh, uh, Berlin Crisis veterans ask me, why is anybody interested in what we did for the Berlin crisis. We didn't go anywhere. We didn't, you know, we didn't fight in any war or anything like that. And I said, you know, you guys were on the tip of the spear. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody had pulled that trigger, if somebody had pushed that button, you were the first ones going to be going over, you know, to, to relieve our forces that were already on the ground there. You know, so, you know, it, it it's it's not like you just went away for an annual training and come right. back home. You did, but there was that potential. Yeah. That well, well, the fellows you talked to were they aware of the fact that that it was the crisis that truly? I don't think that they really thought that or believed it. I mean, you know, you study about the the Berlin Wall. You know, this whole Berlin Wall situation really didn't just happen in the 60s. It was the tail end of the 1950s. Uh, and, and, you know, Khrushchev was talking about, you know, threatening to build up and things like that. Even when the wall started to be constructed, the Western powers didn't think, you know, nothing about it. They aren't going to block it off. You know, the big thing was, on an average, like from like 57, all the way up through 61, you had in the neighborhood of like 300,000 East German, East, oh, yeah. Eastern Bloc Germans, if you will, coming over to the West. And that's what they were trying to stop sure. because, you know, it, it wasn't just the regular Joe Blow and, and his family. It was a brain drain. It mm -hmm. was a, a brain drain. Mm -hmm. and, the so, and the Soviets saw that and that they were trying to curb that. You know, they were trying initially to do it as peacefully as possible, but then it got to the point, you know, it just kept escalating and escalating, mm -hmm. and it finally said, hey, we got to do something, you know, and, you know A lot of people, I don't think, realize that the wall was built around West Berlin, that East Berlin, of course, was the capital of the German Democratic Republic, right. but that's where the wall was. Right, right. And, um, but I, so the fellows from Kentucky, they were called up, they right. were called up to replace guys who were sent over there. Right, basically what, <laughs> President uh, Kennedy had requested was an increase in, in uh, military spending, uh, equipment placement, um, you know, basically uh, shoring things up in Germany, stateside to show that we were serious about this 
was the activation of our of uh, federal or I'm sorry of reserve and National Guard organizations. Uh, you know, in July, when uh, in I think 21 July, he uh, does the the press conference and and lays his plan out to the American public and for the world. Uh, people in Kentucky, the hierarchy in the Kentucky National Guard, you know, felt sure that there was not going to be any Kentucky Guard units activated. You know, they were, you know, this isn't a, this isn't going to escalate. You know, uh, you know. I think with what the president's saying, you know, the, the Soviets are going to back off and things like that. You know, it, I think, you know, the actual construction of the wall and, and what happened there at that last minute really shocked a lot of folks. And, you know, even our guys when they were training, um, you know, like you were saying, I don't think that they, they took it as serious or thought it was as serious as it, as it was uh, and so forth. That might have been best. Yeah, it, it, it probably was. But basically uh, what they were to do, and not only the guys that reactivated, we had the uh, second tank battalion, we had the third tank battalion, and the four 13th Ordnance Company. The two tank battalions were primarily from over here in western Kentucky area. The four 13th Ordnance, which was a heavy ordnance company, which worked on the armor equipment, uh, which was the Patton tank is, is what our guys had, uh, was out of Frankfurt. Now the uh, Ordnance Company and the second tank went to Fort Stewart, Georgia, and they were there basically uh, 10, almost 11 months. And then the third tank. And so what did they do? Just train the whole time? Basically, it was train. Uh, you know, getting that, that preparedness uh, ready to go. You know, I mean, they had to be ready to go at a moment's notice. You know, because like I said, if something happened over there, bat. You know, and then well, next thing so you know, what were they? Had they flown the men over, and they would have flown them over. Uh, people don't realize this. There was equipment on station, even when I was a uh, in the military uh, with the uh, 138th Field Artillery Brigade. We were a rapid deployment unit uh, at one point in time, and part of the 18th Airborne Corps. And basically, you know, we trained up here stateside on our equipment so forth, but if the big balloon went up and, and 18th Airborne was called out, we were part of 18th, we would hit the airport there. That's why our headquarters located right there at uh, Bluegrass Field. We were on the plane, we were over, and we would fall in on equipment that was, you know, pre-designated for us overseas. Uh, you know, so that's basically what would have happened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the second uh, battalion guys uh, that were at Stewart talking with them, um, the equipment they had there was pretty good equipment. Uh, over all the tanks and, and equipment that they fell in on over there. Uh, you talk with the guys out of third tank and they had nothing but junk down here at Fort Knox and they, they had more trouble just trying to keep up with the maintenance on the tanks to try to do their training than anything else. So, mm -hmm. uh, Well, would the tanks have been brought over later? If they had if required they tanks, if they yeah. needed them, yeah. yeah. So there were what, tanks in reserve in Europe just parked waiting for crews? Yeah. There, you know, when, whenever the Berlin Wall came down and that Soviet threat was done away with, we actually sent teams out of Kentucky that went over. And, I mean, a lot of this stuff was stored in these huge caves. And, I mean, you know, th this one cave may have nothing but uh, the old quarter-ton Jeeps. Uh, there was a, a warrant officer out of our supply, USPNFO, there in Frankfurt that was part of the team, one of the teams that went over there. There was equipment, uniforms, uh, weapons from World War II that they had pre-positioned over there that they didn't go over, you know, and, and, you know, okay, well, this is outdated, you know. But he said, Johnny said he'd go in there into those huge caverns uh, where they had this equipment stored. And, you know, I mean, there's historic pieces of property there that were supposed to be stuff that we were going to fall out on if we got yeah. called over yeah. there. So well, as an historian, I mean, it w you'd love to have gotten your mitts oh, on some of that absolutely, stuff. absolutely, absolutely, because it was in pristine condition, you know. So. What did they do with all of it, do you know? Basically, that's what the mission was of those guys, was to go over their inventory, what was there. Uh, you know, a lot of that stuff was destroyed, uh, you know, and part of it ended up coming back in and going out to the military museum system and, mm -hmm. and things like that. So, wow. Yeah. Wow. <coughs> I'm fighting off there vestiges of this really, really bad cold. Uh, we were in the, in Germany in 1990, and we, we, we went over the old eastern part of Germany, and there was a huge tank park uh -huh. of Soviet tanks just 
dozens of them lined right. up out there. I thought, right. wow, that's right. pretty interesting. Yeah. But I've, I've been to some, <coughs> I mean, <coughs> even stateside, uh, I went down to uh, Red River Army Depot. And you could drive, it seemed like, forever. And they would have these tree-lined areas. And you could drive all the way around that area. And then wherever the entrance was for that, you could pull in there. I remember going in and we, when we had the old 880 uh, trucks, the old uh, Dodge pickup trucks that we used that were camouflaged. I pulled in this one area. And I mean, they were just side by side by side by side. And I'm thinking, you know, how about if somebody had to get the serial number, you know, yeah. off that one out in the middle, you know, yeah. that that one wasn't being assigned to somebody. Yeah. You know, it was just unbelievable. And I mean, hundreds upon hundreds of those camouflage Dodge trucks sitting in this tree-lined area. Wow. You know, that we had sitting there wow. uh, ready to, to move out. Wow. We also, earlier, you were talking about a memorial that you all are working on in, uh, in Frankfurt. Yes, sir. Uh, basically, um, this is an idea I came up with in, in 2004, as a matter of fact, and uh, started sharing the idea with a couple of uh, folks there at, at Boone National Guard Center. And, uh, you know, we, we have memorials and monuments to all of our war dead and, and, and so forth. We don't have a memorial honoring our Kentucky National Guard personnel. Um, and what I'm saying there is the Guard has a dual mission. You know, we have the state active duty missions to uh, provide protection, security for the citizens of the Commonwealth uh, during whether it be, uh, you know, civil disturbance or natural disaster and things of this nature. And, you know, down through the years, we have lost uh, soldiers and guard person and air guard personnel uh, to training accidents. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had an incident over here in Western Kentucky during the 1937 flood. Yeah, 37 flood. Uh, young guardsmen uh, had, had uh, basically stepped on a uh, uh, little John boat, flat boat, to go down the river to rescue somebody. That's the last anybody ever saw the young man. Uh, you know, so we, we've had these casualties, and sadly, you know, we've, we've never honored these folks. Hmm. And so that was my idea, was mm -hmm. to go back in, and, and not only our casualties uh, from the wars, but in also to look at our peacetime mission, those young folks that have died uh, in, uh, you know, supporting the Commonwealth with a natural disaster mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever the case may be. And, uh, you know, that's what we're, we're uh, looking at. And, you know, we got thinking, well, you know, if we put names on here, where do we need to start at? Uh, you know, because the Guard's been here since 1792 when we became a state. And, uh, you know, you start thinking about the Civil War, we had, you know, just unbelievable casualties from that. But what we ended up deciding on is on March the 19th, the 1912, we became officially the Kentucky National Guard by federal law. And that's what we're basing it on. We're starting with the mm -hmm. new modern Kentucky National Guard. And, you know, not that we don't want to honor those folks that served in the, you know, we were initially the Kentucky Militia, later the Kentucky State Guard. After the Civil War, it was the Kentucky National Legion, and then back to the Kentucky State Guard up until then in 1912 when it became the Kentucky National Guard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So well, that's a, so the money will be somewhere in Frankfurt. It's going to be at the entrance to Boone National Guard Center. Ah, yes, okay. sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're about uh, halfway through uh, the the donation prod, uh, process. Uh, it's uh, nine hundred seventy thousand dollars, and uh, through our self help and donations and so forth, we're we're like at fifty four percent right now, and uh, we're looking at trying to get this thing completed. Uh, ready to go to do the opening ceremonies on uh, Veterans Day of uh, 2012 next year. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and we've got a website out there. It's just kyngmemorial.com. People can go on there. It has all the data, the information, how to reach us. If they'd like to make a donation, we are, uh, you know, we'll definitely accept a donation mm -hmm. from you. Excellent. Now, on your visit, down here next day or two or three or four how long are you going to stay uh, have you got people lined up or 
basically, uh, believe it or not, I was over at uh, Russellville uh, last month, and there was a reunion of Company A of the Third Tank. And those guys, uh, here again, were the Berlin Crisis guys. And believe it or not, while I was there, I get a phone call uh, on my uh, BlackBerry uh, out of my office, and, and it's a gentleman from here in Paducah, and said, hey, I'm so-and-so, and I need the rosters for B&D Company of the 2nd, 123rd. I said, well, yes, sir, I've got that. And I said, why are you needing the roster? Well, next month we're going to have a little reunion over here at Paducah and so forth of our guys from the Berlin crisis. And I said, and I started laughing. I said, you're not going to believe this, but I'm working on that as a matter of fact. Wow. And I'm down here in Russellville right now working with the guys from A Company. And uh, he said, well, we'd love to have you come down. So uh, that's basically what I'm, I'm down here for. Uh, he's getting folks lined out, and I'm going to meet with them to today and then tomorrow and, and uh, you know start compiling some of this data and information from these two So it, it, do, is it like a form that you use or just let the kind of questions flow or? Uh, basically when we do oral histories it, it's more of uh, I've, I've got a, some some standard questions that I normally do ask. Uh, what I'm trying to do uh, I'm working right now in fact I just had a meeting with Dr. Doug Boyd uh, from the University of Kentucky. He heads up the Nutter Center. The, uh, he's the head of the uh, the oral history department mm -hmm. there for the university. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're looking at a couple of projects, and one being uh, apparently uh, the the director for the community college network uh, is wanting to do an oral history project. It has some money to do this throughout the entire community college network. And uh, when I approached Doug about this, he said, this is exactly what we're needing because, you know, we've got these guard personnel, retirees, the, the current folks, they're all over the state. I mean, I'm a one-man operation, and, and Ish can only do so much and get so far. Mm -hmm. So I need that force <coughs> multiplier. If I've got these, uh, you know, young college grad students uh, and so forth, yeah. you know, and we've got them all over the state, then, yeah. you know, by gosh, I'll work with them, and, uh, and especially if they're going to fund the program, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, more, that much better. But uh, basically, I, you know, work with uh, them, uh, sit down and, you know, because most of these folks have not been in the military, they don't understand a lot of the military jargon and acronyms. So it's, it's uh, you know, a, a learning process for them as well. Uh, it's, it's not just your standard oral history that you, you would normally mm -hmm. do. There is some back, background and research uh, that you have to do on, on these things. Mm -hmm. I, again, the, the I, when we talked, I thought, wow, that has been 50 years ago at the yes, Berlin sir. Wall, yeah, 1961. Yeah. And as you think back, gosh, that's a, that's a long time ago. Yeah. And uh, uh, again, uh, I think the thing that would be really fascinating to me about it would be just to ask these fellows again, what were you thinking then? Well, right. and begin with, they're guard guys. that They do what, one week in the month, two weeks summer right. training, and that's it. Right. And all of a sudden, right. they're pulled up yeah. um, and spend 10 months away from home. Right. Uh, of their jobs, their families, yeah. uh, and that's a hardship in and of itself. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, it's even gotten that much harder with today. It's not that week in a month summer camp for these young folks. You know, if you come in, you're signing that eight year contract, you're almost guaranteed two to three deployments in that eight year period. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, you know, things are, are slowing down. Well, now, the you Army, it, it, it's been reconfigured, hasn't it, in, oh, in that respect, in that. Back in the 60s and 50s, guard and reserve units were strictly guard and reserve units right, right. Uh, that the regular army did. But now, I mean, again, in, the, in our area, right. I know a lot of people who've been to Iraq and Afghanistan yes, from these various guard and reserve units. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, the, the total mission, uh, the, 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 the total way that the uh, big army, if you will, utilizes the guard and the reserve is just totally, totally changed. As I said, it's not just that, that weekend, uh, you know, a guy comes in or a gal comes in the Kentucky Guard, uh, they send them away to their basic training, their advanced individual training, and then the rest of their career is just that weekend a month and then the summer camp. It's not that way. You know, and, and a, a whole lot of it too is, and, and I think Big Army learned this uh, initially with the, uh, the first Gulf War. Uh, as far as the capabilities of the Kentucky, uh, of not Kentucky Guard, but of the Guard uh, and so forth. You know, 
the preponderance of units that went to the Gulf War out of the Guard Reserve side were not combat units. Support units. They were support units. Mm -hmm. Now, we did have 623rd Field Artillery, uh, which is down in the southwestern part of the state that, that did go over. Um, and we had our combat EMPs go over, but it was primarily, you know, those service support uh, elements. Uh, in fact, the very first unit that went was a water purification unit out of Danville, Kentucky, uh, and so forth. But, uh, you know, since then, Big Army has, has rethought the whole thing uh, as, as far as, you know, how to configure the guard, um, you know, what sort of units are there that it's not strictly a support role you know these are combat f folks combat ready troops that, uh, that can go in and, mm -hmm. and support the mission mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well now in your office do you have a lot of archives and records and things there <sighs> yes sir <laughs> yes sir uh, in fact a little bit too much I've got about three repositories around Frankfurt right now wherever I can you know get stuff stuck in there uh, we try to work with the Kentucky uh, Historical Society. We have the Military History Museum. I was going to uh, ask you about Frankfurt. it. Is the Military History Museum open now? It will be open on at two o'clock on Veterans Day of this year. Really? It's been closed for how long? Uh, uh, since 2007. And it's just been massively renovated? Yes, sir. Uh, basically, the Military History Museum is a joint project, operation, if you will, between the Department of Military Affairs of the Kentucky Guard and the Kentucky Historical Society. We, the Kentucky Guard, own, manage the building, the utilities, and things of that nature. Uh, the museum aspect of it, the artifacts, uh, the exhibit, and so forth, that's managed by the Kentucky Historical Society. And they manage it with the personnel up there as far as keeping the doors open. And that's a very historic old building. It's the old state yes, sir, arsenal. It's, it's the uh, old state arsenal. It was, it was actually the fourth arsenal in the state of Kentucky. Uh, it was constructed in 1850. And if you've ever been there, I mean, it's a, it's oh, a it beautiful is. building. It's a wonderful museum. Uh, and, uh, you know, here again, uh, you know, having been built in 1850 and not a, uh, a whole lot of work being done to it, if you will, uh, in fact, I retired in 1997, and, and I went uh, from the Army, and then I managed the Military History Museum for 10 years before mm -hmm. this federal position came open. And, uh, you know, it was a constant battle up there, mm -hmm. uh, you know, trying to keep things well, up and, the and functioning. And few seconds we have left. What is the status of the Kentucky History Center now? Is it? Is it open? It or? is open. Uh, however, they're probably open, I believe, for about another month on their regular hours, and then they will shift to their uh, winter hours. And I forget, you'll have to get up on their yeah, website yeah, as far yeah. as those hours. But it is still open. It is still open right now, yes, sir. And then, they'll, and then they uh, go to the winter hours, and then first part of mid-March uh, next year, they'll back go back the uh, with their regular hours. Well, speaking of regular hours, we've reached our regular end hour, so we've okay. got to stop here in our 30 right, minutes. Uh, my guest today was John Trowbridge the, of the Kentucky National Guard, and my name is Barry Craig. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.